Welcome to the Quan episode. In this episode, Quan takes an illicit substance and then just starts hallucinating ridiculous plot points, which is exactly how the scriptwriters come up with them. And I'm pretty sure it's the only way you can actually get enjoyment from this show. You've got to be completely off your face. But this is Halo Episode 7, I've reviewed the other six, down in the link in the description below. This episode has everything. It's got the main character that you just hope doesn't survive to the end of the episode, a load of tight bees in the desert who kidnap children and then feed them stuff to make them trip balls, but most of all, absolutely nothing about it, which is Halo. Welcome to Halo Episode 7. <laughs> we start with Pasquan, where we find out at some point she used to look normal because she had hair. Are you saying that people with no hair don't look normal? No, I'm saying if you shave off both sides of your head and then give yourself a mullet, that's when you don't look normal. But she's at a meeting with her family and friends and they're telling jokes that would make a Christmas cracker look down on them with a sense of superiority. No, seriously, the reason I'm not telling you what's going on in this scene is simply because I don't want to lose every viewer, which seems to be something that the Halo TV series itself doesn't care about. But some new kid comes along, he sits by Quan, and we find out that even when Quan was younger, she was still a cow. Because while the adults are discussing a fight with the UNSC, which is irrelevant because we already know this happened, because we knew they were at war in the first place, which makes this scene entirely pointless, they're also encouraging Quan to flirt with the new guy. They've just met him, I, I don't know, maybe there's not many people around and you've got to take what you can get. And let's face it, with her haircut later, she can't get much. But this entire scene seems to be put in to show two things. One, even though she looks far better when she's got hair, she has a personality that can strip paint. And two, the UNSC are retreating, and obviously that's for the Covenant, but for some reason, these people haven't put two and two together even though it goes on for years, and even when they find out about the Covenant, they then think they're a myth, even though they knew the UNSC were retreating for something. So they have cause, effect, and then decide to think, that's a lie. I mean, just compare this Quan to the one we get later on. And she starts ranting about, well, even if we win the war, you're all going to be doing the same thing because you still need to eat and farm so you can physically survive. It's because, yes, yeah, she doesn't understand the concept of freedom. If anything, it makes her seem a bit like Samson, except in, rather than her strength being in her hair, it's her stupidity, and she just shaves some of it off, but there's still plenty left around the back. But the father tells her to stop, which is rare, you know, a scriptwriter actually writing parenting into a TV show, and the response is this utter contempt, which is ironically how I feel whenever she's on the screen. She's standing on the wall and all we need is a push and we can solve all of the world's problems. And I hope you're prepared because now we're gonna have to put up with this miserable git face for the rest of the episode. Congratulations. But we start right off the bat with ridiculous, absurd plot points with no explanation. And I'm pretty sure if I asked the scriptwriters for an explanation, they would respond, Time traveling hallucinations, and I'm not even joking, <laughs> because in a car with no windows and no face covering, she decides to drive straight into a sandstorm. It's not like we don't actually have these on Earth to actually understand why you have windows and a face covering. Instead, she accelerates into the oncoming sandstorm. But don't worry, because in this weird sandstorm, all of the sand seems to just avoid her car. It's not even hitting her in the face, choking her. It's not burning her eyes as the sand literally just is beamed into her eyeballs at speed as she's traveling through it. No, it's all fine somehow. It's almost like it's not a sandstorm and they just put a little bit of fog in the background and then gave it a colored filter. And says she's, oh, I'm just having a nice little drive through the countryside. Can you imagine 70 mile an hour sand being blasted into your eyeballs? But as she's driving across this desert on a random path that she had no idea she was going to take, obviously there's some people which are just waiting in the dust storm because they knew she'd be taking that path at that time, even though she never did. So obviously, rather than just hitting them or driving along in the middle of the sandstorm, she decides to park and get out. And at this point, we don't even have a sneeze out of her from all the sand. Instead, we've got the classic horror trope of when you know you're about to get attacked by people going, who's there? Because they're gonna answer, I don't know. But these people clearly know how to treat Quan. Because they put a bag over her head, and let's be honest, we've all wanted to do that over the last six episodes as well. <laughs> but we're back on the asteroid base, which everyone seems to know about, except anyone in any position of leadership. And as you can clearly see in this, all of those asteroids, which are on ropes attached to the bigger asteroids, are still moving, and so will inevitably just smack into it. <laughs> At least in the last one, it tried to show them all being static. In this, it's just like, no, we're all just all attached to each other and spinning around. <laughs> the biggest mysteries in the show are always, how does anyone survive? 
but the Spartan dude who didn't even bring a helmet with him is back on his base magically even though he didn't have a ship and we'll never find out how he got one because the interesting part of his story was just done off screen but what follows is probably the only realistic part of a tv series and that's that this guy is about to get put into a fight because his girlfriend is egging him on <laughs> you're soren's partner you need to start acting like it now get me a drink before i find a man who will at that point Bye! But the sad little beta decides he's going to try and impress her instead. So he decides to pick a fight for some reason. And she's still there behind him, the little devil on his shoulder egging him on. Oh, it was a huge bounty for the little girl. Where's the bounty? You, and he's like, you took the girl for the bounty. You didn't bring the girl back and we haven't shared the bounty. Where's the money? And all he needs to say is I shot her in the face because before I reached the planet, I got so annoyed with her, I thought that no amount of money is worth this pain. And they would have believed it because they've met her. But anyone who's been to a bar has seen this before, it's like two guys squaring up and just behind them is like a type B just egging them on. Yeah, you can do it, Jeff. You show him. <laughs> it's like every time. And that's why I do like this framing because it is her which has completely engineered this entire situation and she's still standing behind him like the puppeteer. <laughs> but I don't know what his plan is because he is picking on a guy with Spartan armor on. So um, he's going to lose. <laughs> And this is another scene where they're supposed to be really intelligent, kind of playing for all the people in the room. Oh, we're all posturing to see who can get the most pirates on side. But it's not written well enough to actually pull it off. At least to her credit, she's trying to calm it down. Not oh, that's going to change anything. So he just poses the question. You tell me, have I lost a step? And at this point, I'm kind of assuming his fist is about to fly through the other guy's face. But apparently, we, we, we can't get that. Probably because the prosthetics would cost too much money. So instead... For some reason, the woman decides to back down and she's like, come on guys, let's go. And they both just sidle off with their tails between their legs. So I thought at least at that point it had some realism behind it. But she went from going, you can do it, Jeff, go on, you teach him a lesson to just, oh, we'll leave now for absolutely no reason whatsoever. But we flash back to Quan, she's still got the bag on her head, and so the world is just that little bit brighter. At least until it's taken off her face. And she's surrounded by women in the desert who are all going through her stuff. The stupid thing is, she gets immediately angry as she's surrounded in an unknown place by unknown people that have just kidnapped her. And she starts demanding things from them. Leave my stuff alone! Leave my stuff alone! And just look at the power dynamic here as she's surrounded by guards who are armed, and there's five of them. And for some reason, she thinks she can get up and start screaming at them. Leave her alone! Oh, I can't stand this person. And she just starts charging off for him. It's like, what are you going to do to the two people and her three friends who are all armed? Please tell me your plan, a oh wise one. And it's just once again the trope of a woman which is captured and somehow, even though she's in the position of weakness, they think it's strength by her revolting against it and just acting like she's not actually the one in a position of weakness. When all it comes across is the type B is so thick, they have no idea the position they're in. They're not aware of their situation. Gone are the days where you'd kind of wittily respond in a nuanced manner to manipulate them or somehow get an advantage even though you're at a position of weakness. Play the situation against the people in charge. Oh no, now we're just going to brute force it against multiple people around us who are all armed. But this woman calls a name and then just walks into the tent and she's like, oh, how did you know my name? Like probably the same way they knew you were driving through a sandstorm even though you didn't. So they walk through a tent out the other side of a tent with even more people which I can only assume she was also going to fight them as well. I don't, I, like, seriously, what was her plan? Because her plot armor's just that good. You were the people my father came out here to see. Like, how on earth do you even know that? Did the pig give it away? But this woman comes over on the right and gently grips their handcuffs and with one hand just pops them open. I'm like, they were that weak, were they? <laughs> In the future, with spacecraft, we have really weak metals. And she's just like, you told him something. That changed him. I demand to know what it is. And she's just, oh, screaming and angry and just being completely insufferable. I don't know how you physically write a character that is this unlikable. The only impressive thing is they gave her a hairstyle which just matches her personality perfectly. The two side shaves of power was definitely the right choice. And she's just like, why should I tell you what I told him? I'm going to finish what he started. You don't even know what he started. 
And she doesn't tell her. She just goes, it didn't start with your father. We've been doing this for ages. It's like, I'm not sure how that's relevant. And the weird thing is they're kind of talking about, oh, you've got to protect Madrigal. But he was only protecting Madrigal from the UNSC. So I don't know who his ancestors were protecting Madrigal from because that wasn't the UNSC. And they're going to say that Madrigal must be protected by the UNSC because they're evil. But the issue is the same alien device, which is saying you must protect this from the UNSC, is also giving Master Chief the visions so that he can find it. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. But you, I'm the last of my family and you must tell me what you told my family. Uh, that's not how that works. <laughs> and the woman just goes, you're not ready, and yeets herself off. And you can just see Quad's face of, <gasps> no one's ever said no to me before. So what's a response? Obviously, she starts chasing after her, screaming, I'm not a child, I'm not a child, which is obviously something every adult says. When I became an adult, I left behind childish things, such as caring if I was being childish. And she's screaming at her because it's the only thing that this character knows how to do. I left behind everything to find you. You didn't even find them. You went through a dust storm and they kidnapped you. I took on a man twice my size and won. Yeah, because your plot armor did it. Because the scriptwriter gave you magic powers. You never would have done it in actual real life. And then... And I'm gonna show it you because you'd never believe me if I said it. I'll fight you all if I have to! You couldn't even fight me, dear. Whereas I think these are meant to be like desert warrior tribe people which have been raised from birth to fight. Like, I'll take all of you No, no you won't. No you won't. Although I would like to see it because it'd be the fastest fight in history. And uh, probably the most entertaining part of the show. And the woman just goes, your rage blinds you to the truth. I'm like, no, that's because she was dropped on her head as a baby. And she says, rage is all I have left. I'm like, no, you'll always have the award for worst character ever written. And also, all you have left, it's all you've ever had. We even had a flashback scene to when you hadn't shaved off your face for some reason. And you were still an annoying cow who just was angry all the time. You know this woman is from an advanced alien species, because even though she's just in the desert with nothing around her, she still manages to get coloured contact lenses. So we cut back to the evil Welshman that's driving across a green screen in, I don't know, is it like a Ford or something? I don't do cars, and quite frankly, it's not worth the effort to even bother to look up. What I think we can all agree on is that is not a futuristic vehicle. <laughs> But the evil Welshman's in the back of the car and he's spouting something which you can tell the scriptwriters didn't write. And he's basically quoting sections from this John Milton poem. But this entire scene's pointless. And they're still just talk about how they can't find Quan and, oh, did she go looking for those desert witches? Those desert witches are what made her father so dangerous. I'm like, did they? Because we find out what they told the father and it seems to just be defend the planet. From what I can tell, they don't actually do anything but, but this is halo trying to get into this weird sort of magical mystery future time travel kind of nonsense and they're just not intelligent enough to write it and i think we've reached a point where i can say that the magic triangle is actually magic because i'm sure they'll go into that well any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic but the way they talk about everything in this and the way everything works it is literally magic there is no limits to what it can do it can do whatever it wants whenever it wants whenever it's required but the best bit about the scene is basically him going, look, Quan got away once. We're not going to do that again. We're going to come at her hard this time. And I'm like, yes, just nuke her. Just nuke her from orbit. Make sure she can't escape. It's the only way forwards. We have to put an end to this Quan character. There's no way we can have a, an hour of the Quan show and not nuke her from orbit. But we're back on the asteroid. And second in command, Pirate Man is uh, flirting with all the ladies. But either way, he goes on to the apparently only tram that exists on the entire base because this is definitely the same place as before. Bearing in mind that these are all on ropes, so only go to one place. And we get the deformed hand of justice joining him in his false suit of armor, which doesn't have a helmet. <laughs> the guy just starts backing up into a corner. It's like, I was drunk! I was drunk! I didn't know what I was saying! But instead, he takes a different tactic. Oh, I hadn't appreciated you for all you've done. You've done so much for me, and I think that we can make a business deal. And I'm like, at this point, if the red warning bells aren't going off in your head at every single opportunity, then I don't know how you made it to second in command of a pirate base. But it turns out this guy is stupider than he looks, which is actually quite an impressive feat. Because he just falls and he's like, oh yeah, we're going to do this score that I planned all along. Oh, we're going to be great pals again. We're going to both be rich. And like, ev everyone can see where this is going. Every single person knows where this is going, except that guy. And it makes us think he's an idiot. 
And that's not a good script. Or if the idea is that he's going to make an example of him and that'll keep the rest of the base in line, everyone will know this guy is an idiot. And so they won't care. Because no one can physically be as stupid as that guy is right now. Except Quan. Now, I don't know if you've been paying attention to the desert planet of Madrigal, but for some reason, the supposed wise woman says this. Madrigal was once very different. Barren and unforgiving. It still is! It's a desert planet! How much more barren and unforgiving do you want? Food was scarce. Water, even scarcer. It's a desert planet! Oh, well, there didn't used to be much food and much water on this planet. Desert planet! But she says, basically, while they were digging a well for water, he then found the fuel, which is what they sell now. But then we find out where the scriptwriters have just decided that they're going to take anything Halo and just yeet it out of a window because we didn't need that anymore. Oh no, this TV series is about to enter an entirely new league of hell. He said he met a being, a visitor from another time. We've got time travel, folks. <laughs> ah yes, time travel. You know, that really complicated plot device which requires an incredible amount of skill talent and intelligence, not just to keep track, but actually to make sense. The thing that so many pieces of entertainment have failed at before. But don't worry, because these people certainly have the wit to pull it off. Perhaps from another existence. Because that makes complete sense. It's not like she even said another dimension. I don't even know what another existence actually is. Oh, he visited us from through the screen into the land of three dimensions. At this point, I'm like 70% that the scriptwriter's just talking about themselves. But apparently this time traveler guy explained to him his real purpose, and that was just to protect the planet. Now, I don't know any rumors or leaks or anything else, so just from my first impressions and first thought about this time traveler, I'm thinking it's either going to be Master Chief or Quan, or maybe that Covenant woman. One of them, probably Quan, time travels back, meets her previous ancestors, tells them that you've got to do the planet, and kicks off the circle all over again. I'm saying that because I think the scriptwriters will think that's really smart, really clever, and no one will see it coming, which is exactly why I'm guessing it now. Because quite frankly, it's the most cliche and obvious time travel plot device I can think of, which is exactly why I think they're probably going to do it. And then for some reason, she reaches into the fire and just picks up some fire on her hand. I don't know why, and it's never explained. <laughs> and she's like, that responsibility has now been handed down to you. Two seconds ago, you were telling her she was too angry to do it, and now you're just like, yeah, it's all, all on your shoulders now, love. I mean, we forgot what happened in the previous scene, let alone the previous episodes. <laughs> but she takes her fiery hand CGI and tips it into a bowl, and it turns into water. No, seriously, we're just going full magic. Oh, it's that advanced technology which turns flames into liquid. Well, then she hands the bowl to Quan and says, you say you're ready. You say you're not angry. Let's find out. And Quan just goes, I'm not afraid. It's like she didn't say you were afraid. She said, you said you're ready. You're too angry. And you brought up being afraid. Can we please have the characters having the same conversation rather than two different ones at each other, which aren't related at all? Please drink this water. I don't like bananas. Nobody even spoke about the pissing bananas. I honestly think I'm losing my mind watching this show. I really do. I even put it off for a day. But she just decides to down the fire water. Like all of this is some ancient two-spirit indigenous ritual is l the angle they're going for. And it's so obvious. These men came and they really struggled on our planet, but we were here all along and know the truth. I mean, I can say that because I'm indigenous to England. <laughs> and then she pulls this kind of disgusted face, which is just like, yeah, that's how everyone feels about your character, love. And I don't know if this review feels different to everyone else, because it kind of does to me, but I, I feel like I'm treating this episode with the same amount of respect and seriousness that they're treating themselves now. I don't even know what they thought they were doing with this. This is the writing equivalent of a dog sitting backwards and then just dragging himself across the carpet with his front paws. The script is a result of the action. But after she drinks the fire liquid, uh, the screen goes blurry and she just starts tripping balls. I'm not even joking. It's like, li this is the plot. Oh, I wish I was joking. Mind you, I wish this series only had six episodes as well. So if this, we'd all be over then. Apparently she sees Master Chief, but she's flashed back to being on the original craft from the first episode with Master Chief sitting down. And it's like, oh, this reminds you of episode one. Do you remember episode one? Back when you thought this series could get a four. <laughs> I can't remember if I gave the first episode 
episode of Score. What I do know is the later ones would definitely have just like retroactively have dragged that down. <laughs> Apparently Master Chief teleports from where he was over by the door and she just starts chasing him around the ship screaming Master Chief what's happening? Like can't she remember being with all the people in the desert taking the liquid and then being somewhere else? Put two and two together you must know you're hallucinating. You must do. How did he get from the desert onto this planet after I just took an unknown substance that a wa random woman who kidnapped me gave me? I don't know. What could it possibly be? Gotta be some good stuff though, right? Because that's not just like a mushroom that she found on the ground. This was literally like some stuff from time traveling aliens which can turn fire into water and create massive halo rings. That would blow your neurons into outer space or at least another IP because for some reason it seems to have transported her back into the wheel of time. That's not what Paid and Fane looked like. No, but it's what he should have looked like. But apparently she's hallucinated so hard she's ended up exactly where she began. <laughs> there was absolutely no reason for her to be in that ship at all. They could have just made her go back in the tent immediately if that's the point of this. But they'll screw like, fair fight, fair fight. It's like, really? I'm not sure that's a fair fight. And to show you just how bad Quan's memory is, we get this line. This is a mistake. And I agree with her. I wouldn't want to fight Master Chief one-on-one -on -one either, but she only remembers that for about five seconds because Payton Fane gives her some chains because that's going to do a lot of use against Spartan armor. Although we do know that weapons don't mean anything in this show. It's all down to who holds them. So, hey, who knows what'll happen? And the woman just goes, let's see how your rage serves you. And, uh, and with all of that happening, she just takes the chains and starts looping them around her hand like she's going to fight Master Chief with them. Puts on her angry face. I think that's her angry face. It could just be her like standing there face. It's always the same. Goes and hits him with the chain. This is a mistake. Five seconds later. Ah, I can't stand this person. At this point, I can understand why in the first episode she was going looking for dodgy mushrooms because if I was her, that's the only way I'd be able to cope with my personality as well. This scene though, does have one advantage. That's that even though she throws the chain around him, uh, it does absolutely nothing because he's Master Chief and she's just a tiny little brat with a chain and I don't know why we're having this fight scene in the first place. She's like trying to pull him over, you know, the Spartan armor, which from what everyone tells me, weighs about a ton and she is about two foot tall. I did point out from multiple episodes the size difference between the two and it's because I just knew at some point they were gonna have her fight Master Chief. And everyone's like, yeah, well, of course he is because the Spartan armor and the Spartans are massive anyway. It's not that she's short, it's that he's really tall. I'm like, yeah, but that's not the point. The point is if she ever fights him, she has to get annihilated and in fact would never fight him because she'd have to be completely mentally deficient, which she is. And then she starts jumping on him. She's like, I can't pull him over. So I'm going to jump on his back. Why are you climbing on his back? Do you think he's like a Sontaran where if you just hit him on the back suddenly his armor falls over. I don't think they've built in that weakness, although this is the Halo TV show, so I'm, I'm, I can't be quite sure. But he just throws her over onto the floor, and then she's like, ah! And Master Chief finally gives the crowd what they want. Pitch black darkness. The end of Quan, ladies and gentlemen. I have never celebrated so much in a show. This is like when Jon Snow died. I was celebrating for weeks until I wasn't anymore. A lot like this show. She comes back. It's Game of Thrones all over again. Just when we get rid of the worst character that I can't stand. Oh, they just come back alive. There seems to be a thing where every single IP I like gets bought out and destroyed. But there's also another curse. Every single character I despise dies, I celebrate, and then they just reappear <laughs> through magic. And magic it is. Because now they're like, oh yeah, you're back again. Fight him again. Because that'll be smart gives her a dagger because the dagger will definitely work against Master Chief. And for some reason, she takes it, stands up again, and squares off against Master Chief again with a weird snorty angry face that I don't know why it's supposed to be acting. And she just starts attacking like with blades against Master Chief's top. It does literally nothing as it should do nothing. So he just picks her up with one hand and makes her fly across the room into next week. Look, I've seen some people say this is a contender for the worst episode, but just watching Quan die repeatedly for about two minutes, hey, it kind of makes my week, I've got to be honest. <laughs> So she's just resurrected, so it could happen all over again. Now, for some reason, he goes, Princess, you're dying all over again. And she's like, I'm not a princess. I'm like, on that, we can both agree. 
You are nothing. You are a wasteland planet which has nothing for nobody, and you're not even its leader. Princesses are supposed to be women who are feminine, ladylike, and intelligent. They understand the court, how to interact with people, and act like a civilized member of society. People of poise, will, and wit who know how to use their talents and the talents of people around them to get what they want and the best thing for their people. Not Quan, who's just a self-obsessed, ignorant little brat. Who, even when faced with Master Chief, thinks she can just pull out a pistol and just start firing. Like it's going to do anything. As he smashes it out of her hand and teaches her a lesson once more. We are doing a live experiment into how low can your intelligence be before you're actually not classed as human anymore. As a people, we define death as when your brain activity ceases. So I'm pretty sure we can classify Quan as a vegetable at this point. Because she decides to just pick up a rock that's just next to her and smash it against Master Chief's armor. Doesn't work the first time, so what does she do? Oh, I'll have another go. Still doesn't do anything. So what could be better than doing it a third time, eh? But I do have a really big pet peeve about this show. And that's that every single rock that she ever uses breaks. That's not how rocks work. This isn't an MMO. You don't use up the durability of something when you're using it. That rock should be stronger than your hands. Either you're using a really pathetic rock, or I'd like your hands to break first. That would also be more entertaining. And then she just starts crying on the floor. And I'm like, I don't know why you're the one crying, love. You've been attacking a man who's done literally nothing to you. All he did is stand there and you just start randomly assaulting him. And when he defended himself, now you've started crying. Master Chief has done nothing but protect her the entire show, even though he has every single justification not to. And how does she repay him? The first time she sees him, she just starts trying to slaughter him with every single tool she can have, repeatedly. And then when she finds she can't satisfy a violent bloodlust, suddenly she starts breaking down in tears. And she looks up at him and goes, oh, what do you want? Like he's done any of this to her. And then Master Chief, everlasting beta that he is, just offers her his hand. And of course takes his helmet off because we can't forget that one. And it's episode one all over again. This girl who decides to attack him for absolutely no reason whatsoever. Obviously, the way he convinces her to trust him is by taking his helmet off so she can actually finish the job. At this point, I'm hoping that that weapon is still on the floor so she can just blow his face off. But apparently, I'm not going to be that lucky either. Because she just grabs his hand rather than her teaching them both a lesson. That she can't be trusted and he's an idiot. But instead, he takes her to the well. Because even though the well is clearly visible on top of the ground, apparently... No one on the planet's ever found it. But don't worry, because time-traveling alien magic person is also there to teach her a lesson. He's like, you'll see him again. He'll be back soon. Talking about Master Chief, because obviously the time-traveling ancient relative knows the future. How? And this is where even their technology equals magic thing falls apart. No amount of technology is going to teach you the future. Magic, though, can. He'll be back here and you'll open the door for him. How do you know that? It's because, uh... I know the future. <laughs> and she says, who are you? And he goes, you know me. It's like, no, I don't. But as he walks forwards to her, he starts merging into all these different people, which is a pretty cool effect. I mean, it's completely and utterly pointless, but it's, it's a pretty cool effect. Because you see all of their ancestors walking through time. And it ends with her father. And she's like, ah, oh, Papa! And I'm like, well, you never cared about him before. Remember when he was stuck under that car and you decided to leave your safe place, presumably to go and save him, except you couldn't be bothered to save him and just ran off in a different direction to leave him to die. And I mean, saying sorry to him isn't going to help, love. And she's like, I wasted so much time being angry with you. I mean, to be fair, your entire life, you've just been angry at everything for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> That's why I call you a cow. It's like, it's my fault. No, it isn't. I should have told you, but I was trying to protect you. You did protect her. No, you don't tell the angry little brat that aliens from the future have come back and time traveled to tell you about how you should protect the planet from the UNSC, even though they didn't know what the UNSC was. And it's so weird. It was a mistake to keep this from you. No, the mistake was giving birth to her. But you're ready now. Why? She's literally been the same annoying brat the entire series, but then she takes one little bit of fire water and gets battered by Master Chief and suddenly she's ready. <laughs> Ow! The only thing she did was break down in tears. <laughs> she started to cry because she wasn't strong enough to absolutely obliterate the guy which has protected her for episode after episode. I was really upset I couldn't satisfy my bloodlust and now I'm ready to save the world. <laughs> 
But she asks, what is it? And he says, it's a portal, presumably to the halo ring. Powered by the precious fuel beneath the soil of Madrigal. Yes, aliens probably made the planet so that it grew its own fuel so it could also power the portal to the halo. I'm guessing. And then he goes, the secrets of the portal will not be revealed until this place is safe. Because obviously the portal cares that a Welshman is in charge of the planet. So the portal doesn't work because of the Welshman, and before that it didn't work because of the UNSC. Even though the same technology powering the portal is also talking to Master Chief, who works for the UNSC and is bringing the UNSC to the Halo Ring. So even though this technology knew the future, it was still asking one group to protect itself from the same people which it's also bringing to itself via a different method. That doesn't make sense, but a load of people are going to think that's really intelligent. Oh, you just don't like the show because you can't comprehend it? No, I don't like the show because it can't be comprehended. I couldn't raise an army. I'm not a leader like you. No, that's because you're a two-foot little child. <laughs> like, look how far you've come, all on your own. It's like, yeah, you left from your town and then went to a well, and in the middle, there was just a lot of crying, complaining, and whining as you got babysat by every single other person in the universe and did nothing on your own and deserved none of it and got everything for free. Congratulations. You have strengths that I never had, says the guy who raised the army, spent his family's fortune protecting the place, built cities, towns, and defended them all from the UNSC. But no, the screaming, whiny little brat who's never achieved anything in her entire life and will never amount to anything and is probably the thickest, most annoying character I've seen in a TV show. Oh, she's just so amazing through the power of fallopian tubes. The only superpower she has is to make TV shows get cancelled. It's time for you to take my place. Yes. Six foot underground. You are a protector. The only thing she's ever protected is her own brain from actually absorbing any information. I'm all alone. You kind of deserve that, though. You did that one to yourself. <laughs> Have you tried not being completely insufferable as a physical human being? <laughs> Possible thumbnail number one. <laughs> But my favorite part is when she goes, Vishnu's men are coming for me. And he's like, just let them come. I'm like, yes, please do. Please do. Let them annihilate you off the face of the earth. But then he says, to be a good leader, do not seek to control the events around you. Use your own gifts and meet the enemy on your terms. And we'll find out what that means later because it's just as stupid as you probably expect. And he's like, go back to where it all began. I'm like what, your mother's womb? He's just going to start shoving. Climb back up. You're not wanted anymore. <laughs> And there we have it. The delusional hallucinations of time-traveling aliens are behind us. But unfortunately, she survived. And she just comes back and goes, I'm a protector! Is, like that, is that what you got from that, really? Yes, we're all going to be protected by the two-foot-tall little tiny child. Yeah, congratulations. I've got a really lot of confidence in that one, love. Are you really the protector? Or is everyone else going to do all the work for you and you're just going to take the credit? That's not a question, that's an observation of every single thing that's ever happened during the entire show. But we have a quick detour to the pirate takeover of the UNSC ship. Not a single part of this is relevant to the story at all. But essentially they take over the cargo and he's congratulating his mate. Oh yeah, you don't- Oh dude, you did really well, you did amazing. And she's like, yeah, we're stepping up in the world. Despite the fact that I clearly encourage you to beat up a guy that you physically couldn't take in a fight. We've done amazing out of this one. Not a single one of them can see it coming. I, I, it's like, But essentially the forklift truck, because in the future they still use forklift trucks and haven't come up with any better technology. It gets stuck and he starts helping him push it or pull it. I don't know why. It's not as if he can physically pull a forklift truck. It doesn't actually make any sense. But in a clear trap, he just decides to lower it on him right on his foot. And of course, it was all a plan. And has nothing to do with the line that we had previously in the episode, which was uh, about getting a step ahead. And he's just like, oh, we're just going to get the boxes and leave you here. And then he asks the guy's woman to also move the boxes. And she just says, I'm sorry, and does it as well. I was like, yeah, no one could see that one coming. <laughs> the type B that makes you take on a fight that you can't physically win also isn't loyal. <gasps> oh! Who would have guessed? I mean, at this point, he is lucky that he actually lets him go because I fully expected him just to leave him there for the UNSC that inevitably would turn up. But apparently, no. He's just teaching him a lesson by making him lose all of his toes. But the guy's wife is just like, was that necessary? It's like, ah, they got to learn. Well, what are they learning? They're learning that fear rules. And this is him supposedly turning to the dark side. And he can only be saved by the love of a good woman who says, no, maybe you should go and save that tiny little annoying brat that you just left on a planet. I'm, I'm telling you, if you want perfect grounds for divorce, 
Her going, I think you should spend more time around Quan, is the best one I can physically think of. Yeah, that other guy's woman made him lose a foot, but at least she didn't tell him to spend time around Quan. But we're back on Madrigal, and the Welshman has a plan. And we have another example of a Type B in a situation she can't control, and yet doesn't seem to realise it, and so starts mouthing off her, her captors again. It shows how powerful she is. No, it shows how low her IQ is. Because this is a scene where she causes all of the trouble for herself. Meanwhile, Quan heads back to where it all began. Yes, episode one, because... I suppose that was an expensive set, so we've got to use it again. In the seven episodes, there will have been three which had action sequences in them, and two of them will have been on this set. And all of them will have been on, like, desert or rock planets. Because it's cheap. Ten million an episode, folks! And I've got to say, her hairstyle seems to get worse by the episode. It's not just shaved on both sides. But even where it is cut, it's like all uneven and gone round itself. Like, there's just big chunks out of it all the way around the edges. Who do you have doing your hair and makeup, the work experience boy? And is he blind? Now the weird thing about this is the alien bodies are still there, and this has got to be like weeks since the first thing happened. Not a single fly on any of the corpses, and I was actually assuming that the human bodies would be here, but I'm guessing the reason they're not there is because they'd have to pay all the extras to actually lie on the ground and they don't want to do that. So, all the human bodges have magically gone, but the alien ones are still here. Because if you're going to clean out all of the corpses so that, you know, disease and death and destruction don't spread through an area, uh, you'd definitely leave some of them. Even in war, they don't just leave the bodies of the enemies on the ground. Especially when there was only about four of them that you'd have to deal with anyway. Like, it wasn't even much extra effort, and it stops all of the disease, and the rotting, and the flies. Even though none of that seems to have happened here, presumably because they're just CGI. But the Welshman's interviewing her aunt, I think it was, and he's just saying, you know, what did that guy ever do for Madrigal? He's trying to get her on side, trying to find out where Quan Ha is. And she's like, he gave us pride. Yeah, because you can eat pride. And she's just giving him stick like she has any power here at all. Once again, a type B in a situation where she's been kidnapped is surrounded by people with guns, has absolutely no control over the situation, and yet decides to make an arse of herself. Because he's like, the Ha family is weak and vulnerable. And she's like, well, you're so deathly afraid of them, though. Yes, I always think pissing off the psychopath is always the best way out of a situation alive. And that's the only thing you'd be concerned about in this. You'd have two aims. One, you don't give up Quan and you keep loyal to her. But two, you play your cards right and try and get out of there alive so that you can fight another day. Of course, in modern shows, every Type B apparently doesn't have the IQ to realise this. Which says more about the scriptwriters than me commenting on it. Because he asks her where Quan is, and she goes, even if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. And you could just go, I don't know. That's the same answer, except one might get you out of there alive, and the other is just asking to leave with a massive hole in your forehead. And she looks really cocky as well. Ah, wouldn't tell you. <laughs> so, oh, what are you doing? This does not make them look powerful. It makes them look stupid. But of course, he doesn't need to worry because they've got satellites and magic tracking data that they can just spot Quan from outer space as she re-enters the city. Apparently, from that little red blur, it recognized her as Quan. Don't know how. I expected it to zoom in on her face and like show incredible detail because they've just got really good cameras. Would have accepted that. Not a little red blur. After she's just badmouthed the complete psychopath who just lines people up in the street to off them in public. She's like, I need to leave now because I must get my perishables stored. No one cares about your ice cream that's melting. Your frozen peas on the biggest problem you've got here, love. And the fact that you don't understand that makes you look like an idiot. But he's just like, oh yes, yes, of course you can leave. And every single person knows what's about to happen, except her. This is a TV show that really, really wants to make every single type B look amazing and powerful and strong. And all of them, without exception, comes across as absolutely pathetic or evil, often both. Because of course he just fires at her in the back. Obviously that was going to happen. She should have realized that, after how she spoke to him in the first place. If she actually cared about getting out of there alive, she could at least acted like a bit subdued and submissive. But of course you can't do that 
because it's the current year. So instead, we're just going to have characters, scripts, and plots, which make no sense. Because we know how characters should act and would act in the situation, but we've given ourselves arbitrary rules so they can't act that way. So off they are, chasing Quan in their Ford. And I know it's not a Ford, but again, I just don't care enough to find out what it is. Meanwhile, Quan, without a care in the world, is just traveling around going into old houses. And I believe this one's her parents. She goes and hugs this tree stump and then decides to read the letters which are underneath it. Letters which have just been out in the open, publicly available, under this tree stump, which she clearly knows because she treated it with such reverence, and she's never read them before? Ever? Even though the letters seem to be about the exact thing that she just hallucinated over, which is his father asking for information about what on earth is happening and why the aliens from the future are talking to me, and how he's a protector. <laughs> it's even got the portal there. <laughs> Yes, all of the keys to the plot were literally in letters on the side under an item that she cared about, which has been in her house the entire time, and she never bothered to read them, right until she hallucinated, which then for some reason made her think, oh, I'll just read all these letters which have been here my entire life. It, uh, what? There are so many better ways to do this. She could have, like, seen some kind of alien symbol, which they then saw carved into the wall, which she'd never paid attention to before, and now she realizes, hey, maybe that actually means something, and she finds, like, a hidden safe or something which her father had given her the code for when he was on his deathbed or something like that. There are so many ways that you could have done this, which still would have been cliche, but would have still been far better than just finding some letters on her side which she's just happened to ignore since she was born. But she hears something in the city and panics. I don't know, maybe it's one of those many alien corpses that were out there, just come back to life. I can't think of any other reason that would have stopped them being taken away by this point. Bearing in mind as well that this is a planet where one guy parked his spaceship and it was immediately taken for scrap. And yet this is an entire city which was destroyed with no people in it, and not a single person has come to harvest any of the things in it. No, all of these items were just left there. Not a single pirate or scavenger even thought to come here. Weren't interested in any of the alien tech? No. Alien armor? No. That not valuable? No. But the little two foot tall child is prowling around with her handgun out like she's going to do anything to anyone. And of course, the moment she sees the spawn, she points the weapon at his face again. I kind of wonder if he wishes he'd taken his helmet with him at this point. But she asks him what he's doing here, and he's like, well, I told you before, you owe me a ship and a load of money, and I'm here to collect. And she's like, I'm not going to give anything to you. And it's like, well, it is your debt. And he's like, well, if I found you, then the other people can't be far behind. And at this point, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. Was that satellite just a public satellite? Or was it their satellite and he hacked into it? And if he hacked into it, then he knows that they will know because it's their satellite? And if he didn't use their satellite, then how did he find her? I've got so many questions, and I'm never gonna get any answers from this show. And she's still pointing the weapon at him, and at this point, she shouldn't have a face anymore. And he's like, look, do you want my help? And she's like, I'm doing just as fine on my own, thanks. It's like, no, you've done nothing on your own for the entire series. You've been mollycoddled and taken around from pillar to post by every single person, babysit every single way, spoon-fed every single piece of information, and like, I'm doing fine on my own. You've never done any anything on your own. The moment you lost him, you ran away and got kidnapped by other people who then told you the next piece of the plot. You didn't even work that out. But this guy, I do kind of like this guy, and he seems to be the only person in the entire series who may occasionally say something truthful. You're too young or too stupid to understand, but- There's no but about it, she's definitely too stupid to understand. And it's not that she's too young, it doesn't matter how old she is, she's never going to grow under the brain cell. <laughs> but then he says, I made John a promise I was going to keep you safe and I intend to keep it. And I'm like, you could have just kept her on the asteroid then, it's not like she was going anywhere. She certainly wasn't going to pilot a ship out of there. I'm amazed she can pilot her own feet. But then he asks for his pistol back, which is reasonable, considering it is his. And she just puts in a belt against the person in Spartan armor. And this definitely would wouldn't be the interaction between the couple. It's like what? <laughs> That's all it would take for him to get it back. And she's like, oh yeah, you can't take it off me. He could take it back anytime he wanted and there's nothing you could do to stop him because you're a pathetic, whiny little child. But at that point, the Welshman turns up and he decides to use a bullhorn to her for some reason. Yeah, I always like to announce to my enemies that I've arrived. But what we do see is that uh, he arrived with a lot of people and ready to party. Like, really ready to party. But he's just like, sit down, shut up, I'll handle this. And she's like, you'll die! I'm like, well, you've never cared that anyone else would die for you before. We'll both die. Ah, there we go. That sweet self-interest, that explains a lot. But the advanced military machine, who has been trained in weapons and tactics and strategy, decides to turn to the little child and go, 
Well, do you have a better idea on our military tactics? And Quora response is, yeah, let them come in because she's really smart. And it turns out that it's not just her which is stupid, but her entire city. Because what they've done is built a city around a big gas pipe where whenever there's gas in the pipe, a single spark will blow up the entire town. Oh, we didn't need any safety features. Oh, no. I mean, I'm pretty sure that a gas pipe is generally intended to have gas in it. It's just that these people didn't put in any safety features or anything else and then built all of their civilian homes around it so they could blow up at a moment's notice. Uh, I think now we've got proof that genetics does actually influence IQ. But Quan's got a plan to survive. Oh yeah, you know that steel vault we put all the kids in? Yeah, uh, if we're in there, we'll probably survive from the gas explosion. Now I can't quite remember, but didn't an alien with an energy blade slice his way through the door in there to get to the kids? I'm gonna go and check. Okay, so I went back and it turns out the alien just pulled on the doors and opened them which makes it even more stupid because they're calling that a vault that's where they put all their innocent people in there and it turns out it's not even bolted or locked or anything and you can just pull on the doors <laughs> This is the Fort Knox of the town. And she's like, yeah, we'll probably be safe. He's like, probably. Like, you wanted a plan? That's it. It's like, well, your plan is trash. Like, really trash. His plan of just let's beat them all up was way better. And she's like, if we're going to fight, we meet them on my terms. And it's like, haha, that was really clever. You actually just quoted a hallucination from the future at him. Yeah, that's really smart. If we're going to fight, we do it on my terms. Because I'm a little two-foot child and you're a master of military strategy and obviously we should ignore your plan for mine because I've never done this before and I have no idea what I'm talking about. Why is any of this happening? And he's just like, yeah, okay, as long as you get to shoot someone. When you write a character, they're supposed to stick to the character and make decisions that that character would make, not just say whatever you think would sound good in the moment. But this guy and the Spartan are easily the best parts of the episode and he's just like, Quan, if you come out now, I promise you, no harm will come to you, I give you my solemn word. And the guy in his left's like, what, boss? You can't be serious. And then he just shakes his head like, no, we both know that's not true. It's amazing. In other shows, I probably wouldn't like that bit so much. It's like I'm a thirsty man out in the desert and they just dropped a little bit of water into my mouth and I'm like, that was great. And it's like, to anything else, I wouldn't actually be a big deal at all. But in this, it's like one of the few seconds of quality out of the entire hour-long episode. And then she just starts mouthing off at him. I think it's meant to annoy him, so he comes in. And I'm like, you do realize he was just going to send everyone in anyway. <laughs> so once again, this is Quan's really smart and she's manipulated him into doing exactly what she wanted. It's like, no, he brought all those people specifically so they could shoot you in the face, which quite frankly, I'm all for. And she's just like, I will never surrender. I'm like, all right, Braveheart, calm down. You may take the lives of everyone I've ever loved but you'll never take my freedom because a man's going to protect me but then in go the red shirts but of course she tries to pump the gas into the pipe after she's annoyed them all because she didn't consider checking that first and her plan doesn't work because it's Quan. so i don't know what anyone else expected so it turns out they need to go across the entire base and turn it on manually and they have a little bit of an argument about who's going to do it and she's like no you'll never make it there i've got a safer route turns out she had money after all and she's like, i told you i was rich uh we both know you had no idea that was there that's why your aunt told you that you didn't have any money because it was all spent. You're actually not rich. You lied to him so you could get him to do what you wanted because you manipulated him. You actually just lied to him so you could get him to do what you want. But the show's already forgot that part of the plot. So the bullets are coming in because now they know where they are and they're just all, ah, we're all gonna die. But she gives him his gun back because let's face it, he's gonna need it and uh, dives into the ground so she can be safe. Well, uh, he has a little bit of fun. <laughs> where he sees the money is like i could take the money but no i've got to go out there and probably face certain death all because he didn't take his helmet away when he was a student it's a mistake so she goes through the pipes underground the evil welshman comes in and just starts talking about the corpses it's like whoa well they're really ugly it's like yeah they've been lying out in the street for weeks what do you expect and also you have seen Quan, right and it seems like the entire cast of glee decides that they're going to walk in armed so it'll be good. And they immediately start dropping like flies to one man with a pistol. There is a pretty cool explosion, which seems to have engulfed one of their faces in it. <laughs> which, let's face it, means it wasn't real. And we get a kind of a typical action scene of a guy wandering through a whole crowd of enemies, none of which hear him, know he's there, or anything else. But we get a little bit of a cool scene where this guy walks in, he pulls out his knife, and he yeets it as his neck, and a load of other people come in. Now, this is one of those really choreographed scenes where it's like he's holding one guy's arm and the guy just doesn't resist in any way, shape, or form. But I can at least make it pass here because he's 
in Spartan armor, so presumably has enough strength that they couldn't resist anyway, so eh. And you get this scene where there's three of them all in among some tankers, and the guy just starts smashing the other guy's face into him. Boy, he cracks his neck and decides he's going to take everyone else. And then, obviously, we're using the guy's body as a shield. Now, he's already in armor, so you'd think he'd be fine. If anything, you'd want to lift him over your face, considering that you don't have a helmet on, dear. But then he just beats crap out of him. There is a moment in this where the other guy kicks him in his side, and he's like, loses balance, but his arm is meant to be really heavy, and the guy just kicked him. This whole fight acts as if this is just a normal bulky guy, and not a guy in Spartan armor. But despite that, it's an action scene, more than I've got in the rest of the show, or the rest of the series. We also get to see Quan just scurrying around like a rat, scared of all the fighting above her. And look, it may not be the Quan six foot under that I wanted, but it's still a positive. <laughs> But she finds her way up and escapes, only to immediately get seen by another guy. And I'm like, oh no, this is going to be another girl power moment. But the guy just grabs her, smashes her into a wall, and she tries to fight him. She kicks off the wall, knocks him over balance because they fall down some stairs. Seems reasonable, but she still can't resist him because he's just physically bigger and stronger, which actually makes sense for once. And the, and the only reason she actually survives in that fight is because the other guy saved her. It's actually reasonable, and she didn't just magically do it all herself. Honestly, it's like this fight scene was written by somebody else to the entire rest of the series. Like we saw in Doctor Strange, Type B can't be saved by Type A, and yet that's exactly what we had here. It's probably the most down-to-earth and realistic part of the entire series. He wasn't humiliated, she wasn't made to seem superhuman, and it's a very, very small thing to ask, but we so rare nowadays. But either way, she gets the button and starts the gas. Now this guy hears it, must know something's going on, but just carries on as normal. Now Spartan dude is out in the open, just annihilating everybody, and for some reason they're not, like, hitting him. But he's talking about his bullets, he's like, well, I need one for the gas tank. It's like, they've all got weapons? You could just pick up their weapons. They didn't even use most of them because you just took them out silently. He actually had loads of bullets. He just decided to use his two revolvers for some reason. But either way, unfortunately, he gets nailed in the leg. Apparently, the armor isn't on the leg. I don't know what parts it covers, to be honest. And at this point, their only aim is to get to the vault. But there seems to be people all over the vault. So Quan's running around. And this is what I mean about the scavengers. Are you telling me that no scavenger came in looking for anything to take away or any alien technology? Like, I don't know, an energy grenade? But either way, Quan sticks the energy grenade to him, which she somehow knows how to use even though she's never seen one before. And the guy goes boom. At this point, Spartan decides I'm going to make a run for it. And runs literally headfirst into where all the enemies are. Takes one of them hostage and all the people don't seem to care as they're still firing. <laughs> Evil Welshman is an incredible shot because he takes loads of time to line it up but then nails him as he jumps over a table and shoots the guy in the neck. Now, I'm not a doctor or a biologist, but I have a feeling that if you get shot in the neck, that's a serious problem. But don't worry, because this guy leans over, gets a rag, and then just places it on his neck. Problem solved! <laughs> At this point, Evil Welshman clearly thinks he's won. He's telling Quan to come out, and Quan finds an AR. As far as I'm aware, has never used a weapon before, but... Uh, I think she's gonna have to learn fast. Now this guy, who's just been shot in the neck, is like crawling as if he can barely move across the ground, which is reasonable because he's just got shot in the neck, but he's going after his revolver, which is over there, as if they're not gonna notice him. Of, of course they did. They noticed him. And for some reason, the guy starts quoting the Milton poem at him again. But at this point, Quan has flanked him. She's got the perfect angle. He has no idea he's there. All she has to do is rest the gun in a, like either on the bars or on her and she could absolutely annihilate this guy and no one would know any better. She even pauses and then decides to run for some reason when she's in the perfect position. And then in what I think is pretty much the only reason they even said the poetry to begin with, this guy responds to him in the same poem. And you can tell this guy's like, oh, I've got newfound respect for you because you're clearly a man of culture and intelligence as well. And I'm like, R is that the only reason you did it? Is that the only reason you had the poetry in the car earlier? He just thought he was a thug. But now he's realized that actually he's not superior to the rest because they too also can know poetry. I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure this is meant to be the Spartan owning the Welshman simply because he knew poetry. A man would have had them fighting each other not talking poetry. But don't worry, because Quan has the IQ of a turtle, and she decides that she should leave her flanking position to walk all the way around to in front of the group so that she can attack him from a position inside his own eye line. Why won't I take this guy out of the surprise and take down the leader of the entire group when I could take him by not surprise? 
from the angle that he's already covering. But don't worry, because she has no intention of actually shooting any of the dangerous people. Instead, she nails the exact shot on the gas pipe, which has no safety features, and will just simply explode at a single tiny spark, even though I'm pretty sure if you shot a gas tank, then I don't think any of this would happen, because there's no guarantee that the bullet going through it would even make a spark in the first place. And at this point, the only thing that would happen is she would be filled with 500 different bullets, because all of those people had their guns trained on her, and she's just shot. So their own reflexes would be to fire back at her, and she'd just be on the floor in a pile of her own blood. But apparently, none of them do anything. Well, that's not true. They do turn around and ignore the person who's just fired a weapon. And then the entire thing explodes. That's right, the engineers here, with no safety features, decided to build a civilian base with kids on around an explosive tanker. And obviously all of the enemies get it immediately engulfed in fire. Almost as if it was in a really badly designed town. This has to be the only gas tank that you could never fill with gas because you surrounded it with people and made it easier to set on fire than a box of matches. Even a match, you have to strike a couple of times sometimes to get it to go off. Not this tanker though. Also, there are windows in that vault, and so all of the fire just immediately came through the windows and would have turned that entire place into a kiln and burnt them to a crisp. But apparently, no, uh, the fire just stops just short of their face. Despite the fact that it blew up the entire town and the thing sticking out of it all the way to the sky. Stop just short of their face, though. Then we find out that the time-traveling desert women aliens from another dimension or something uh all knew it was going to happen and all were just standing outside waiting all is right with the world just like our magic water told us it would be but then they leave and because the evil welshman has been destroyed it starts to rain because presumably the portal is unlocked and so it's rewarding them with what a different temperature is the planet going to be green and lush again you remember they said it was a desert to begin with when they first arrived and it's a desert now but now the portal's making it so it isn't, I don't know what even going on. And seriously, if rain is meant to symbolize that oh, you've solved a problem, then uh, I, I live in the UK. It's always raining here. We must have solved every problem known to man a long time ago. Oh, and don't worry that the guy that got shot in the neck is going to be in any trouble because remember he put that thing on his neck, so now he's fine. And despite the fact that he could barely walk before, uh, he's just walking around all fine now. Not a problem at all. All great. Oh, I got shot in the neck. It's fine. I didn't get medical treatment. I don't know. Maybe that fire that came in through the gate cauterized the wound or something. I don't know. I can't even think of a reason why. Maybe the magic rainwater is doing it for him. I don't know. And I mean, we've ended every other interaction with the alien technology with an O face. And I think we're getting it as well, judging by our expressions during this. And look, every episode seems to be spot the hidden cheeks and uh i think this counts i think this close-up counts there is no need for this angle and this scene if it's not to get his cheeks in it really isn't because they could have used this scene but they didn't because they wanted to include the cheeks but yeah he gets the evil welshman ship which looks um suspiciously like his old ship and he gets all the money and she's like i'll see you again in the future he's like not if i see your first love which let's face it is how everyone that has watched this show thinks it's like the only time i would ever approach it is if we were on a bridge and that's just so i could push her off but i do think that the script writer is at least a little self-aware when we get this interaction see each other again god i hope not that is every single member of the audience and then we get quan determined i'm the big powerful woman Look what I did! And I'm like, you didn't do anything, you did everything for you. That has been, happened the entire series. You've been babysat every single step of the way, and then you just take credit for it at the end. But don't worry, because we're going to zoom in on her face as her nostrils flare, and that is the acting talent that we've seen episode after episode. I know I can do anything on my own, as long as a man does it for me. And that was it! And I mean, what did we learn? That basically, Quan is like a game of hot potato. As soon as you get it, you want to just pass it on to someone else as possible, because if the music stops, it's probably going to get you killed. And if it doesn't, well, let's face it, you're going to have to spend more time in a company, and that's just going to make you wish that it had. She got babysat by everyone, passed around by everyone, just dumped information that she didn't deserve, got other people killed that were trying to protect her, and she did nothing to deserve any of it. She's supposed to be the protector which requires just somebody else to do all of the protecting for her, and then she's going to stand there and go, I'm amazing. You didn't do anything. You're the most insufferable person I've ever seen in a TV show. And the only exciting part of this was when somebody else was fighting or when you were getting absolutely destroyed by Master Chief over and over again. And quite frankly, we should just have that for an hour. I would have laughed my tits off. I mean, I would have laughed so hard at that. I would have passed out just unable to breathe. 
And while I did appreciate what should be an incredibly basic scene of just when she gets into a fight, the two foot tall child can't beat up a man and has to be saved by someone else. So I'm surprised that was in, but I'm glad it was. That is still basically something that you shouldn't give something bonus points for. That should be the standard thing we expect. It's just that standards seem to be dropping because nobody is allowed to do that in a TV show or movie anymore, apparently. Even if later on she did save everybody, so I suppose they thought that balanced it out. Then we've got the Spartan with the self-healing neck. But the big conclusion about this is, what about this was Halo? What about this was Halo at all? Was there even a single bit? I mean, she found an AR from Halo, and there were a couple of corpses that no one had bothered to deal with or scavenge during the entire time. I think that was it. I think they were the only two things, and they were references at best, rather than a Halo episode. Which, is it surprising, considering Quan has nothing to do with Halo at all? Even the Spartan, when he's in a fight, he just is acting like a boxer, not a guy in Spartan armor. And as you can see by the fact that normal human beings are just able to kick him and he can fall over, despite all the weight? But despite that, and despite having the entire episode based around the worst character of the entire show, or any show, there were a couple of redeeming features for me. The action bit at the end, I did kind of like. The fact that we got to see Master Chief beat her to a pulp repeatedly, I have to say, that was a high point of the show. And I think those two things made it less boring than sort of episode two and three, which uh, I think three was the worst. That Honestly, they're all merging into one another at this point. I actually thought more happened in this episode and it had a faster pace than any of the ones at the UNSC headquarters, for instance. Although the fact that you've added time travel into this means... I don't know what you think you're doing, but that's going to be a complete and utter disaster that you are not going to be able to keep track of. None of the episodes in this show actually have a very high bar. None of them are good. We're literally just debating levels of terribleness at this point, but that's the situation we're in and probably where we're going to stay. So, uh, with that, I want to know what you think. Did you watch it? What did you think of review? What did you think of the various different parts I talked about? Let me know down in the comments below. Like the video if you like the video. And subscribe if you want more videos like this. Or reviews of other shows in the future. Like Obi-Wan Kenobi. But for now, that's it from me. I'll see you in the next one. And I'll see you in the comments down below. But for now, that's it from me. I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.